So uh, there's two clickers up here. I'll just grab one, hoping I grab the right one. Yeah. We'll, uh, I guess we'll find out quickly enough. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, wow, what a great couple speakers. I literally chased Dr. Sally Davis outside saying we should do a Superbug X Prize for sure. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I love her slide that showed market failures uh, because that's where X Prize plays. We actually research the market and we try to identify where innovation's not happening by traditional problem solvers in society, uh, whether it be the government, industry, uh, research academics, or other NGOs, and we find that blind spot or that gap where others aren't focused on it. XPRIZE takes it on because we think the crowd can solve many of our grand challenges. Um, so I'm going to uh, take, I think I grabbed the wrong one. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, I'm optimistic as well, like Mo was saying. Um, I'm, uh, I, I do think that, and I, I've been pessimistic for the last 10 years, I'd say, but there's something that's happening right now in the world that gets me very optimistic. I want to try to break that down for you because it's the basis of, of where XPRIZE as a nonprofit tries to look for problem solving, uh, new mechanisms for problem solving. Um, and I, hopefully you'll see that there's some optimism when you think about how quickly the world's changing and how we might harness that for good. Um, how many of you are familiar with this graphic that Ray Kurzweil published in The Singularity is Near? Um, so what this represents, this is just the data plotting of calculations per second in computing that $1,000 buys you over all the forms and fashion of computing in the last 100 or plus years, from electromechanical computers to relay to vacuum tubes to transistors to today's Intel chip to the integrated circuit. And notice that this is on a log scale, so this is an exponential trend. And what this data translates to is that over the course of all of computing and all its forms and fashions, it has been more than doubling in power. So this is essentially Moore's law. And notice that there's these technology S-curves that each form and fashion of computing leads to another form and fashion of computing to make computing faster, again, sticking with the exponential trend, the doubling pattern. Integrated circuits will transform into quantum computing, DNA, wet computers, et cetera. Um, so why is, this, why is this relevant? It's the basis for a lot of the discussion we're about to have. A um, couple things here. You don't see World War II or 9-11 or any world events that have thrown this trajectory off its course, which means this doubling pattern is something that is pretty stubborn, pretty significant. Um, and it's exponential. It represents an exponential trend. So I'm kind of a geek here, and I'm going to show you some real math on an exponential trend just to kind of uh, bring it back to kind of our Math 101 days when we looked at trends like this. If you notice, this is right out of Excel. I simply put a doubling pattern from 1 to 30 to show what an exponential trend actually looks like when it's not on a log scale. Notice that it's very deceptive that the doubling pattern is very small in the early doublings, the smaller doublings, but then it completely, it, it starts to compound itself and it becomes very disruptive. And so computing power has done this since the inception of computing power. And it's leading to this disruptive trend. And right now in human history, we're living through this uh, knee in the curve in terms of where this computing power falls. And that's creating this phenomena of the democratization of certain technologies. These are technologies that only big government or big business, big industry had 20, 30 years ago that now has been democratized into the pockets of individuals. Artificial intelligence, 3D printing, advanced robotics, uh, uh, gene sequencing, DNA editing, um, all these technologies and all these forms of innovation have been around for a while, but they're hitting their knee in the curve. They're hitting these exponential trends. And once something becomes digital, it becomes exponential. So biology is mer merging with technology, it becomes biotech. And now it can ride that doubling pattern we see uh, with exponential trends. And so in human history, we're hitting that knee in the curve. We're hitting this compounded uh, period of time where these doublings represent not the last few years of what our linear brains process, but the last 100 years now happening every 18 months or so. And the convergence of these technologies are relevant, so are, are relevant in terms of how AI is being applied to 3D printing or advanced robotics or gene editing. So this is the first result of this type of phenomena. It's creating the democratization innovation, innovation to where we have this new type of empowered individual. That an individual entrepreneur can essentially change the world in critical mass like we've never seen before. And this is not just one person, this is, this is everybody is starting to have access to it. And so you see this innovation renaissance that is literally happening right in front of us. 
I was a partner at Deloitte Consulting. I led the innovation practice before I took this role at XPRIZE. And my whole job was to go to ecosystems around the world that were flourishing with innovation and entrepreneurism. From Tel Aviv to Silicon Valley to Brooklyn to Berlin to London and really understanding those networks. And if any of you do that, and this is a crowd that does do this a lot, you see it right in front of you. You see tremendous, and you see innovation and invention that is occurring at a pace that we've never seen before. And you feel this, and you see this type of power of technology in the hands of individuals being applied to this extent. The other thing that's happening is that the world is getting connected as we know. The stats on this is today we've got about three and a half billion people, the 3.9 billion people that are connected to the internet. That's up from just, in 2000, less than a billion, 600,000, 600 million. Within seven years to 10 years at most, it's predicted based on the Google Loon project, the Facebook drone, the satellites, um, Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, all, everybody's work, satellites, we're all working on putting infrastructure in place that gives everybody access on the planet to not only cheap, if not free, internet access, but at, but at a pace of download rate that's, that blows away what we see today. That's real. That's happening right now. We see it happening. You look at the trend, it's going to happen. Imagine when we put five billion new minds in the next six to eight to nine years connected with each other. This network of empowered individuals gets to be essentially the emergence of a new asset class that the world has never seen before. And it is literally happening right now, right around the corner, we're going to hit this landscape, this type of asset. It is a group of connected problem solvers, and that is where XPRIZE plays. We recognize this, we recognize the power of the crowd or the wisdom of the world, and we want to exploit it and tap into it as much as we possibly can to solve humanity's grandest challenges. This is a class of problem solvers that just didn't exist years ago, and it is going to be the most prominent problem solving class the world has ever seen. And that's why we're optimistic. Um, you have to engineer a model, though, to tap into that wisdom of the world. Uh, if you look at the traditional problem solvers that we've come to rely on as a society, from government, private industry, the venture capitalists, startup scene, universities, research labs, NGOs. I mean, that's what Dr. Sally Davis was basically on stage talking about how there's market failures around the superbug where none of these groups are solving these, that problem. And she was basically pleading with us to get engaged. So. What XPRIZE does is we ask this question to this traditional problem-solving group, who are our partners, by the way. These are groups we work with. We ask them, here's a grand challenge facing humanity. Here is a timeline that we researched on when this grand challenge has to be solved. Again, Dr. Sally Davis was giving us timelines. She was saying it gets to this point of no return where we have to solve the superbug problem. That's why I love the per presentation. We see this all the time. Here's a timeline. We have to solve this. Otherwise, we're foobard. For, anyone remember that term from the old movie? Um, and she's basically saying, who's got this? Who's going to do this? Anybody out there? And she was saying, she literally had the word market failure across those traditional problem solvers, basically saying nobody's going to do it. And it's explainable. Government, we're too linear. That's an exponential problem. We, don't, we do not have that. Industry, there's no profit there for us, so we're not going to focus there, at least not yet. The VC, entrepreneurial market, there's no capital there. So as a startup, as an entrepreneur, I'm not focusing on that. Research labs, we got a lot of other problems we're working on. That's just not one of them. And other NGOs, yeah, we're trying, but it's hard to innovate. We need some help. So what XPRIZE does is we work with these groups, we identify this, we create these future impact maps, we call them roadmaps, where we take a domain like oceans, or education, or health and wellness, or space and exploration, or infrastructure and shelter, or energy, and we identify with these traditional problem solvers, what are the moonshots, not 10% improvements, but 10x improvements that we need quickly on a timeline the world needs it, to solve this thing that all of you traditional problem solvers are saying you're not going to do. And then we partner with that group to set up the XPRIZE model. 
Now think about what we're doing here. A lot of people misconstrue what XPRIZE is actually in the business of. We're not really designing prizes. We're designing a behavioral science instrument that we're dressing up like a competition in order to gamify innovation to solve a big problem. It's a behavioral science exercise. How can we ar architect an instrument that can get the world crowd to be their Google engineers or Facebook engineers or startups by day, but on their nights and weekends, they take that intellectual property and try to focus on solving a big grand challenge? How can we get world citizens to take that knowledge they have and incentivize them to, to spend their own money, their own time, their own resources to solve a big problem? And with XPRIZE as a nonprofit, they keep all the intellectual property. We just try to help them. We help them test, we help them connect to experts, and we try to pay them through the prize model. And then we try to help them scale. But the behavioral science instrument we're creating is using game mechanics, it's using incentive competition um, methodologies, it's using prize theory. Everybody likes a good competition, but we're dressing it up as a competition. It's really an instrument of change to provoke the world citizens, some fraction thereof, to get serious about solving a problem. And we put up a $10 million, $20 million, $30 million prize, we always get 300 million, 400 million, 500 million dollars of investment from hundreds if not thousands of teams spending years to focus on that. So we create an, an, an enormous amount of R&D in the field, just getting rapid experimentation. All these different shots on goal with a lot of diversity. And the goal is, let's crowdsource the wisdom of the world and the genius of the crowd to solve these problems. So in other words, the world, we've got this. We're empowered to solve these problems. We don't have to be dependent on the deep pockets of government or industry anymore. We can do this. Individuals have access to AI, 3D printing, advanced robotics, biotechnology, the blockchain, CRISPR. You see what's happening? There's a convergence happening, which should give everybody some hope that if we orchestrate this right, we can actually start to solve big problems. The formula that we're after is we want to rapidly experiment we want to generate rapid experimentation. Good example. I, I love the chart, again, that Sally Davis just showed, because you know how she showed all the R&D? She had a calendar across the bottom, and she showed all the R&D that's been going on, and she showed it's been dormant for like 15 years. There's no experimentation. So when we announce an X Prize, we'll get thousands of experiments literally overnight as soon as we announce the competition globally and get it up and running in a field that would never have experimentation. And so we get rapid experimentation. The timing of it, back to this exponential curve, is we look at launching something right before it hits the knee in the curve. We call this, uh, to use a Wayne Gretzky quote, skating to where the puck is going is the model. So we know that here's a 10x improvement, not a 10%. Here's a moonshot. Probably sounds like science fiction, but we know it's science reality. We've got some pretty smart people on our board. We've got Larry Page. Elon Musk is funding one of our biggest X prizes right now. He's been part of the model from the beginning. Ratan Tata, uh, Dean Kamen, Ray Kurzweil, Peter D. Mandis. These are folks that think about the art of the possible when it comes to technology and innovation. And then we take a social lens on it. We take a geopolitical lens on it. We take an anthropological lens on it. And we say, what is the big solution we need as a breakthrough? What's the technology art of the possible? But how do we do it in a responsible way? That's the, way we, that's the focus of the research. And then we launch it so it hits the technology curve. So we launch it a year or two in advance so the teams have time to prep. And then it ends right as we hit that spike. If we go too far to the exponential curve, we'll launch something like we did a genomic X prize. We had to cancel it after we launched it because it was too easy, <laughs> even though a year before it was considered science fiction or extremely expensive to do. And then the other key, rapid experimentation, the model is, if you sign up to compete on an XPRIZE, which is a three, four, five year times, time horizon, because these are really audacious goals that we put out there, we're, we, we engineer it in a way that gives people the cycle to rapidly experiment. So you can fail and learn, fail and learn, fail and learn. You don't just show up at the final competition three years later and see what the results are. We give you the, the ability to ameliorate your design. And then we focus on rapid and critical mass with a lot of diversity. Think about that it gets to be somewhat formulaic in statistics. If you can get a critical mass of rapid experimentation with a lot of diversity, so a biologist taking on an engineering problem or a creative artist taking on an education challenge, you get different perspectives, you need that diversity curve. Statistically speaking, if you do that, you can pull it off, you incentivize the needle in the haystack to come to you. And that's the model. 
We have a lot of X prizes that are currently active, doing a lot. We've done a lot in oceans. We're on to our third X prize in ocean. We're doing something with carbon, taking carbon out of a smokestack and turning it into something valuable. We have a women's safety X prize that we've launched in India with X Prize India with Ratan Tata, who's on our board. One X prize I'll share with you in closing here is the Global Learning X Prize. This is a $15 million X Prize. I'll, I'll share with this uh, in 60 seconds or less. It gives you the idea of a quintessential X Prize when it's done really effectively. So what we've done is market failure. There are children in the world whose parents didn't get educated and nothing's gonna change for those kids. They're not gonna get educated. There's no schools. There's no profit motive for industry to develop software, other things for them to learn. So it's just a fact. They're not gonna get educated. The market failures are there. We worked in Tanzania with the government of Tanzania. We went across 200 villages and identified 4,000 illiterate children in those 200 villages have no access to schools or education. Some of them have never even seen reading and writing. We then worked with the World Food Program and UNESCO of the United Nations to go, put, um, go to each village, culturally assimilate ourselves into the village with the village mama and the village elder. So they understood what we were doing and they were receptive to the whole notion of it. We spent over a year and a half doing that cultural assimilation. Then we went and installed solar energy with the World Food Program in those 200 villages. So they all have electrical power. Then Google gave us 8,000 tablets, two per child, with the 4,000 illiterate children, two per child. They donated brand new Android tablets, and we put them into those villages. And we've done and established that over the last year and a half to two years. We built that infrastructure. Meanwhile, we said to the rest of the world, hey, if you can, we don't care who you are, what your background, what school you went to, what degree you have, we don't care. If you can create software that can go onto this tablet in this village and can get an illiterate child to a third grade proficiency roughly in reading, writing, and basic math, you can win $15 million. And in crowdsourcing the world for that, we had 700 teams of rapid experiments, 198 teams competing in 45 countries as we got down to the down select across six continents, and we just gave five finalist teams a million dollars each. And of course, we got the diversity spread, the models working. Some are using art and music to teach. Some are using cognitive learning and logical thinking and reasoning to teach. Some are using um, gamification techniques. Some are using AI. That's the spread we had. And the software has to teach in English and Swahili. Again, no market for this. No private industry is going to go after that market. And it's all going to be open source. The teams keep the intellectual property, but the model is open source. That was one of the requirements of the, of the competition. And that is a great X prize because it doesn't even matter if anybody wins it anymore. Someone will win, but it, it doesn't even matter. The benefit of doing the whole process, two to three years of taking 4,000 tablets, putting them in the villages, culturally assimilating the villages and the culture to the technology experiment, and then working with them on the, on the entire X prize. We have anthropologists and sociologists that now want to have exposure to see what happens to a young girl's confidence as she teaches her elders or her peers how to use new technology. That's X Prize for you. Thanks for the time today. Appreciate it.